even in the situations when there is no hope. I give you another example. I was in Romania, my first district ever, 30 years ago. I had a big head, not physically. I thought I was somebody. I have so many bachelors, and I have so much education, and I have so many businesses, and I have so much money, and I, am, I have connections. I know the prime minister. I know the chief of police. I know the mayor. I'm, I was somebody. I felt that I was somebody. Okay? And because I gave money to the church for evangelism, for buildings, for whatever, you know, projects, and because I was involved with the youth and involved as an elder and involved with evangelism, they called me to be a pastor. And I gave up my average in Romanian money when the salary was 2,000 a month. I made 50,000 a day, every day, literally every day. I remember when I came home about 40,000, my wife said, what's wrong with you, only 40,000 today? <laughs> I gave up my salary and moved down to 2,464 salary a month, pastor salary when they call me to ministry. And I knew for sure that they are going to give me, because I gave so much money to the church, they are going to give me the biggest church in the biggest city. They gave me the smallest, most difficult church in the mountains. <laughs> I had an expensive Renault Nevada. I don't know if you know Renault Nevada. A Renault 21 is called, Renault 21. You Google it, it old. Old times, but nice car in that time. I had a nice expensive car in Romania when people, not too many had a car, you know. And I took my car to visit my district. And they told me, don't take your car there. I got suspended. I remember Rusta was the location. I got suspended on a rock. And they had to pull it to the tractor. And they destroyed the belly of the car. So next time, I took the train. They told me to get off the train and take the other train, because this train doesn't go there. It was a train that was smaller. Bench is made of wood. The train was smoke like chuk, chuk, woo, chuk. You remember like in old movies? <laughs> and the train had the tracks and then another truck in the middle with a wheel that had like teeth to be able to go up the mountain there. Whoa, I said, this is fun to my wife, you know. When we got there, they, there was no blacktop. It was raining for three days and three nights. I had a Giorgio Armani suit, <laughs> Ralph Lauren tie, polo shoes, you understand? And my wife got off the train in the mud. And I said, I'm not stepping there. I says, get off the train. The train is already moving. Get off the train. I put one foot down. It went deep in. I put the other foot. When I lifted this one up, the mud got into my shoes. I lost my temper for a second. I said a few words. My wife said, calm down. You are a pastor now. <laughs> I got to the church. And it was Friday night. They had church Friday night. And people came straight from the farms, smelling as they came from the cows, milking cows and raking manure. You follow me? Yeah. The smell was so bad. And they hugged me, and I was like, OK. <laughs> and they didn't even change or took a shower, just straight from the cows to the church. I said, what am I doing here? And I started to preach. You got to do evangelism. You got to reach the lost. You got to believe. You got to. And they said, we don't understand you. Well, let me explain again. You got to. And they said, you don't talk our language, pastor. We don't trust you. You preach whatever you want. We do whatever we want. And they would not listen to me. And they said, oh, you pastors talk a lot, a lot of theory. But you don't understand what real work means. I said, are you kidding me? I work more than 10 of you together. I move like a bullet, like Superman. <laughs> ah, we don't believe you. Well, I remember one day, it was October. One of the elders had a big farm. And his combine broke. And he could not harvest the corn. And the rain was coming. And he was losing the whole harvest. He would be broke. And he came to me crying, pray for my combine. I need to fix the combine. And there was no way for him to fix it that week. And the rain was coming. So I talked to the church. I said, when one suffers, everybody suffers. When one rejoices, everybody rejoices. We are together. Unless we are together, we are no Christians. So tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, the whole church in his field, if you don't come, you are not a member. Look for a different church. 
And I said, tomorrow morning, everybody harvests corn. If the whole church goes, we save his corn. They, are you serious, pastor? You care for us? Are you kidding me? We all suffer. That's the reason we cry together, we help one another. We, because we got to be one family. Let's go there. The whole church came. They took one row each. I took two rows. By the time they were halfway through, I got to the end and came back. And he looks at me and says, you move faster than you talk. <laughs> I don't know if that was a compliment or not. But. <laughs> and then he came to me, the head elder, and says, now you can preach. Now we trust you. And he said to the church, one word, he said, listen to him. And the whole church listened. What a power in one man, you know, alpha cow. All cows follow the alpha cow. <laughs> he said, now listen to him. This pastor cares. So I told him, we need to reach the city. Pastor, these people are workers. How do we do that? I said, well, let's pray. How much do you pray for the village? We don't? Well, let's pray for them. We started to pray. I started to preach. I started to train. And we plan to do evangelism three months later. And I started to tell them that in the Bible, the body of Christ is formed out of members. And each member has to function. If the eye don't function, the whole body is sick. If your legs don't function, the whole body suffers. If your tooth doesn't function, if your kidney doesn't, whatever in your body doesn't function, the whole body is sick. The same in the church. We all, there is no one to be lazy. A lazy Adventist is no Adventist. And I said, everybody has to work. And so let's organize according to your gifts for evangelism. Who does the children? Who does the music? Who does the worship? Who are the registration booth? Who are in the parking? Who are the greeters? Who are... And we started to organize everything and organize how we do the invitations. And the, you know, there were two men in the church that they were mentally, literally sick. Two brothers. And they would grab you by hand and they would not let you go. And they would look into your eyes, Pastor, uh, let me go. Ah, we love you, Pastor. I love you too. Let me go. Ah, ah, we want to stay with you, Pastor. And they would not let you go. So I would av avoid them when I would see them. And these two brothers came to me right after I finished my sermon that Sabbath. Pastor, oh, heaven, what am I going to do? You said everybody is a member in the body. I said, yes, I did. You said everybody has to work. Yes, I did. Give us work. Uh oh. We want to be greeters. That's what they said. <laughs> no. <laughs> you will embarrass the church. We want to sing. No. Can we preach? Mm -mm. Give us work. You pray. Okay. Now let me go. Uh, okay. They went home. And they started to recite. We pray, we pray, we pray. And instantly they stopped. Who do we pray for? And their father says, well, evangelism is for the village. You pray for the village. Okay. And then they stopped. But the village doesn't know. And they decided to go to the village to pray. And these two men, mentally challenged, went to every street, every house, from the first to the last. And they prayed house by house for the whole village. You think that's easy? That takes commitment. They went from 8 a.m. to whatever, 8, 9, whatever p.m., and they prayed house by house. And I know some of the stories from people. They knocked in the door. The pastor said we should pray. What do you want us to pray for? Because we don't know. Well, my wife left me. Lord, bring her back. Bye. <laughs> That's it. No introduction, no conclusion, no long, nice, flowery prayer. Next house. The pastor said, you know, and they came to me a month later. Pastor, we prayed. What do we do next? <coughs> it was peace when they were gone, you know. <laughs> so I said, go back and pray more. In my mind, just leave me alone. I didn't believe that this man can do anything. Because they are not capable. Shame on me. They went back when I said, pray more, to the first, to the second house, to the third, to the whole street by street, the whole village. And they pray again for the whole village, house by house. They went to the first house. 
What should we pray for? Well, after you pray, my wife came back. Lord, thank you for bringing her back. Bye. <laughs> they prayed. A month later, they came back. Pastor, one more month to evangelism. We finished praying. What do we do next? I said, just leave me alone. Pray without ceasing. Go. <laughs> <coughs> Guess what? They went back to the first house. Second, third, fourth, fifth, every house. And they prayed third time with the whole village. When we had evangelism, the whole church brought two people. They brought over 46. I don't remember, 46, 47, 48. A lot of them got baptized. I asked them, did they teach you doctrines? No. Did they talk to you about Sabbath? No. Do you know what we believe in? No. You want to be baptized? Yes. Why? Because nobody cares. The village doesn't care. Our families don't care. Our churches, our pastors don't care. Our friends don't care. Everybody is for self. You guys, you care. Nobody has come so many times to my door to keep coming and keep praying. You guys, we can see the spirit of Christ in you. We want to join your church. We don't care what you believe. Whatever you believe, we believe because we see God in you. I was embarrassed of myself. It was a lesson for me to understand that is not your education, what is good, you should be educated. It's not your training, you should be trained. It's not your experience, you should have experience. But it's the power of God to change a heart. <laughs> and if God could use a donkey, <laughs> God can use anybody. Yeah. If, God, if God could use two demoniacs to send them back, you remember? Yes. And the Lenoi says, next time when Jesus went there, the whole town came because of the work of those two demoniacs. If God could use two demoniacs that didn't go to Andrews <laughs> or to Walla Walla or whatever. Don't get me wrong, Andrews is good. But nobody has an excuse. I didn't go to Andrews, I cannot work. You can. You have no excuse. Because it's based on God's power, what God can do. God promised, go and I will be with you. Remember? Go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and I will, lo, I am with you always. If you go, God promised to be with you. Why don't we go? Because we are too comfortable. That's the reason. Too lazy or too selfish. No offense. If you are offended, we need to pray for you. <laughs> but the bottom line is this. Eleanor says, God could have come long ago, but we are not ready. And then she says, we have a work to finish. She says, it's not the promises of, of God at fault. You remember the quote? The quote? But it's our lack of commitment, she says. I have the quotation. Anyway, our time is up. I want you to... Uh, <clears throat> whoa, our time is really up. <laughs> I, I want you to get to the introduction for the 11 o'clock sermon because I don't know if I have time to give the sermon, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> I want you to understand, please... Please, I am talking from the heart. I'm not giving you uh, the theory of prayer, though I do have a seminar on prayer. I am talking from the heart. Unless we act on it, we lose time. We have a tendency to believe because we are Adventists, we are God's people, we are okay. Mm -mm, we are not okay. Because God gave us a mission. And to be in the books of the church doesn't save you. Pharisees were Abraham's children, God's people. And they had the doctrines just as we do. And they followed the doctrines faithfully, kept Sabbath and everything just as we do. God called us to save the lost. To go, not to wait. To go, not to wait. I remember when I was 17, I was the choir director. Oh, the choir director. I thought I was somebody. And I prepared what I thought. The best Christmas program in the history of mankind. I mean, we worked four months. We had songs. And we had children choir and men choir. And the church big choir. And we had drama. And we had poetry. We even had some actors in, art artists in the church paint some pictures with Christmas around the church. And had some scenes, Christmas scenes. You know what I mean? It was four months' work. We had the best program ever, what I thought, you know. 
And after he gave the program, the whole church applauded, and I was humble, but I felt like a turkey, you know, big, uh, you know, <laughs> look what I did. And then I went home. After the church, after potluck, everything, I went home, and I told my dad, did you enjoy the Christmas program? Wasn't that good? And my father, cool, without any emotions, he says, who prepared the program? I want you to say me, but I want you to be humble. I said, we. He says, who is we? Well, uh, the church, the youth? Uh-huh. And who listened to the program? I said, the church? And my father says, son, if you have a cow, and the cow makes milk, and then the cow drinks the milk, then why do you have a cow? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? I said, son, you never do farming in the barn. You do farming in the field and bring the harvest in the barn. Israel was rejected not because they were all bad or all good. They were rejected because they refused to do the mission. They isolated themselves from the nations. They were supposed to be a light to the nations. To spread God's love so everybody could be saved. To, their house was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. Abraham was supposed to be a blessing for all nations. But they isolated themselves and did everything in the sanctuary. And nobody was allowed in. And he says, you do just the same, son. You are a good Pharisee. And he says, why do you have programs in the church if you do it for the church? Go outside and have programs for the community. Or if you do it in the church, go to the corners, to the streets and invite the community. Don't have programs for yourself. You prepare the program. You listen to the program. You applaud yourself. And you say, what a sermon today. What a choir. Let's go home. Hello. Why do we have church? If it's not for the lost. Hello. And my father said to me, if you really want to be like Jesus, then you need to think about what can you do for the community, not for the church. And he said, yes, it's good to serve the church. But everything has to have one purpose alone. How can you save the lost? Amen. What if our churches would change their mind thinking from interior focused, many times how to survive, to exterior focused, how to grow? And instead of focusing to keep the church afloat, focus on attack. How to attack our community. I'm going to talk about that tonight in detail. I'm going to give you practical examples. Nuts and bolts. How can you be a light? How can you be such a blessing, salt, that the community needs you? And you have a real influence in the community. And everybody knows it. Let's finish right now. Huh. I had quite a few more stories. We don't have time. But I want you to know. God has a plan for each one. He says, I know the plans I have for. God has a plan. It's quite sad. That so much we are not interested in God's plan, but rather in God's blessing for our plans. You don't need to tell God your plans. He knows your plans. There is nothing wrong to present your plans before the Lord. But more than that, you need to seek His plans. Elena I says, and this is a powerful quotation. She says, Jesus made no plans for himself, but every morning he received the plans from the Father. Period. And then she continues. So should we. Every morning, present our plans before the Lord, ready to give them up or to fulfill them according to his will, and then seek his plans and put him first and trust that he will take care of our needs. Powerful, isn't it? I'm going to ask you to Take some time again and pray seriously about it. Don't look to impossibilities. If you look to problems, if you look to challenges, if you look to yourself, you think, yeah, that's possible for Abraham, but not for me. That's possible. Uh-uh. It's not in your power. Paul says, I can do all things in Christ. It's not about your power. 
Stop looking to problems, to challenges. Start looking to God. Because the more you understand Him, the less you are afraid. Oh, we don't have the money. If God gives you the plan, trust me, I could give you a bunch of stories. God gives you the money. The problem is not money. The problem is our commitment. Our lack of knowledge of God. We don't know our God. Our God owns all the money. I will give you a couple of stories tonight. When God wants something to happen, it's raining with money. What we actually need, we need to know our God and we need to seek his plans every day. We are so afraid that if we don't follow our to-do list, what's going to happen to us today? I've experienced it again and again. When I follow God's list, God takes care of my list too. Just try it. And don't try to take giant steps. Take baby steps. Start praying 15 minutes for some neighbors. And as you pray more and spend time with God more, you will enjoy it. And then you increase after a month or two or whatever to half an hour. And you don't need to keep increasing until you pray four hours every morning. God would impress you how much you need for prayer and study and your devotion and so on. Maybe one hour every day, maybe one and a half. I don't know. God wakes me up. I ask him to wake me up and, she w- and he does. And sometimes he would push it a little. He would wake me up at two, you know. And I say, come on, Lord, it's too early. <laughs> and sometimes he would wake me up at five. But I never, I would never start a day without God. When you start a day, you need your battery in your cell phone full. The same your spiritual life needs to be charged before you can be a blessing. You need to be connected. So start with baby steps, but start. And if you have already started, many of you, I suppose, do. Then increase it. Say, Lord, what do you want me to do next? Because if God tells you what to do, he's going to give you the power and the joy and the blessing. Just ask him what he wants you to do next. And don't worry, what if I do a mistake? If you do it without knowing, God doesn't care. He ignores. He winks at ignorance, you know. The problem is not what you don't know. The problem is what you know and you don't want to do it because you are too busy with other things. Just ask him because God will make it clear and God will lead you. The problem we have is not that God doesn't help us. The problem is that we don't commit enough. We are too busy, distracted with other things. We worship other things. And Jesus is coming, actually. And these things are going to burn. And Satan would love us to be so distracted that we sleep when he comes. But God wants us to be way awake fully awake, fully committed, fully consecrated. Let's do that. This is not, Ellen White calls it a lifelong daily process. She says, commitment, surrender, repentance, service, she says, is not something that you do it once forever. You need to do it every day, again and again. You need to fully commit every morning again. You need to invite his presence every morning again. You follow me? You need to ask for the fresh baptism of his spirit every morning again. As you need to breathe continually, as you need to eat continually, not continually, every day. (laughs) So you need to call God's presence and God's power and God's spirit. You follow me? And to surrender your life every day. And as you do that, It's not your business when do you grow. Pastor, I've been praying for a week and I don't grow. None of your business to measure, to monitor your growth. You keep praying and serving and let him worry about results. Because you don't understand how God works. Even if you try to, you'll never be able to understand God's brain. You just need to trust his promise. He is able to finish what he started. He is able to save the uttermost. He could save Rahab. He could save the woman at the well. He could save Zacchaeus. He could save the thief on the cross. He could save Mary. 
He can save anybody. None of your business how he does it. Your business is to commit every day and to trust that he is faithful. As you do your part, he will do his part. And Ellen White says in Christian service that you will not see like the wind, you will not see the work of the Spirit. You may look and you may get discouraged because you don't see anything. But she says in time, in time, a year, two years, as you look back, you will see the change, you will see the results. So keep working. Don't look for results. Don't look for miracles. Don't look for a voice. Don't look for blessings. Continually, constantly seek the Lord, seek his plan. Commit yourself every day. That's your part. And he will take care of the rest. And later as you look back, you will see the results. Okay? You understand? Take a few minutes and pray. And then maybe somebody else is going to have a closing prayer. Maybe you have announcements. I'm going to take a little break. God bless you.